the one of the organizers of the meetup. Um, you may also see Larry Swanson there, um, one of the co-organizers, and Jim Pacheco. Um, Larry's kind of our uh, producer here tonight, and he'll be um, keeping an eye on the on the chat and uh, looking for your questions there that we can kind of queue up for Corey afterward. Um, you'll have noticed that we're recording, so be aware of that. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick, a uh, couple of quick notes about the meetup. Um, I've got a, you can see there, we've got um, a Twitter account you can follow. Um, we have a YouTube channel where all of our uh, past videos, the, the video, the events that we have videos for, um, the videos are posted there. Um, we'd like to invite everyone to join us on our Slack channel. We have, um, that's a place we, we use to kind of share resources and do things like share links to videos and slides and it's also a jobs channel on there. So um, we will put a, a link to uh, an invitation link to that in the chat at various points tonight. So um, keep an eye out for that. And then if for any reason you just want to contact us, there's, uh, there's our email address. Uh, wanted to just kind of give a quick preview. Um, we do these, of course, every month, and we've got um, some uh, some great uh, folks queued up over the next few months. So um, in April, we will be hearing from Sarah Johnson, who's going to talk about content first design. Uh, in May, we've got Bram Wessel um, talking about the denial of service attack on meaning. Um, he's been doing a lot of work around disinformation, um, so that should be really fascinating. Uh, in June, Scott QB is going to talk about content ecosystem maps. Um, and then in July, we've got Michael Haggerty via. I don't have the title yet, but um, no doubt um, will be about you know, design systems and strategy. So uh, just a few things, uh, again, about kind of our community here. Um, we are um, gathering uh, input and, and uh, interest in a mentoring program. Um, so we've got a survey for that. It's very short, um, but if that's something you're interested in doing, either as a mentor or a mentee, we'd love to hear from you. We will put a link to that in the chat too, or you can always just contact me or send email to that email address below. Um, we're working on that now um, and kind of figuring out what, that, what that's going to look like. Um, we're also thinking about doing a different kind of event in August. We're going to do... Um, we're looking at doing a, a lightning talk event, which is a lot of short, usually like five minute talks, kind of like Ignite, if anyone's ever been to an Ignite uh, event um, with a lot of different topics and they're, they're really fun. Um, and we'd love to uh, to hear you or to, to have you involved if that's something you're interested in doing, if there's a topic that you're interested in, but don't, uh, don't want to put together a, a full length presentation, but want to do like a little, a nice little bite-sized five-minute one, that would be great. Um, we're also working on a new website, um, hopefully coming a little bit later this year, and that's mostly so we have a place to kind of um, do more of kind of consolidating all of our, all of our resources and our information. Um, we'd love to have people contribute to that. Um, there's going to be a, you know, a couple of opportunities there for community uh, content. So if anyone's interested in that, again, just reach out uh, with that uh, via that, that email address at the bottom. So now let's uh, get on to tonight's event. So um, Corey Vilhauer uh, is Director of Strategy at Blend Interactive, um, where he leads the strategic design process, uh, focusing on content strategy and information architecture. Uh, Corey is co-author of the web project guide from spark to launch and beyond <laughs> if you do not have this book go buy it and not just because i mentioned on page 91 there are many other reasons to, to own this book <laughs> um what, what where am i uh <laughs> sorry uh he, uh, Corey, also co-hosts with Dean Barker, who was a speaker for us a, a few months ago, um, a podcast um, also called The Web Project Guide, um, and writes about content strategy um, at the URL that you see there, eatingelephant.com, uh, and does other, uh, other uh, things at uh, coreybillhower.com. So without any uh, further ado, please uh, welcome Corey Billhauer.
Thanks, Paula. You're the first person who's ever called out their own index. <laughs> Isn't is that tacky? Good. It's very tacky. I'm sorry, but it's all right. Um, I actually Paula, was not looking for that. I was only looking for content audits. But. Sure. <laughs> um, will you set it so I can share my screen? It says I don't. Yes, it won't let me. I will stop my share. Oh, I see. Oh. Um, okay. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh oh. Larry, well, yeah, sorry about that. Larry, I think you had left the uh, room for a minute and came back or something. Oh, yeah, right, because you made me a host. Yep. Ah, there we go. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'm very excited to do this talk. Uh, I've done this talk a few times, um, and I uh, really enjoy it uh, for a few reasons, not just because it's kind of based on uh, the book that we um, we recently published, I was gonna say recently wrote, but we wrote it, uh, it feels like over the span of, well, we did write over the span of two and a half years. Um, and it did, it was actually went out uh, in 2020, but uh, the, the physical copy is, uh, is, is out there for you to buy if you really want to. Um, today, I want to, um, today I want to talk about context. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a few things when it comes to, uh, when it comes to context. I, uh, I want to talk about the nature of our work. I want to talk about how we're very good at what we do, but we always can get better at understanding what other people do. And I want to kind of give practical thoughts on how to bring different areas of expertise together, sort of in this spirit of multidisciplinary success. Um, you will have this warm feeling of collaboration and knowledge when you get done with this. So that, that'll be great. There's going to be a non-zero amount of self-promotion for a book that is very um, that is very out to buy. And most of all, there's gonna be a secret at the end. And I'm telling you that now because that's the prize you get at the end of the talk. That's called content marketing, I think. I'm actually not sure. Um, I don't think most of us have figured out exactly what that is. Anyway, hi, um, my name is Corey Vilhauer. I am director of strategy at Blend Interactive where I do lead the content and information architecture practice for all of our client work. Um, and also co-author of the uh, web project guide. And this is my talk. To start, I wanna talk to you about the difference between raccoons and pandas. I grew up loving raccoons. My favorite book was Rascal by Sterling North, if anyone remembers that one. I felt per personally attacked whenever I would see one of those like hats with the raccoon tail hanging off the bat. Rac raccoons are rad, you'll never tell me otherwise. Pandas, however, still not impressed. Pandas do one thing. They eat bamboo. They can only live in the most absolutely specific and perfect conditions. They have no natural desire to breed. They're like dopey, slow, large raccoons. In fact, if I had it my way, we wouldn't be calling raccoons trash pandas. We'd be calling pandas like dumb raccoons or lazy raccoons or picky little raccoons. Mm -mm. What I'm trying to get across is that raccoons make things happen and they make things happen because they're generalists. Generalists understand and adapt. Instead of drilling deep into one area and mining that one area forever, they spread their focus onto like the breadth of a discipline and beyond, collecting little bits of knowledge and, and focusing on how the different disciplines uh, fit together. In fact, this was the main point of uh, a book called Range, which is uh, by ProPublica's David Epstein in which Epstein makes an argument against over-specialization. He argues that while the world has uh, specific and simple problems, uh, the most successful problem solvers spend mental energy figuring out what type of problem they're facing before matching a strategy to it, rather than jumping in with, with memorized procedures. So in other words, raccoons, forest dwelling animals that have the skills to find food and shelter in nearly every environment, natural or man-made, who have like specific industries that are dedicated to preventing them from gaining access. Raccoons are scrappy and they're absolute pains in the ass and they can be incredibly violent. But more than anything, raccoons are problem solvers. They don't get pigeonholed into a specific set of actions. They don't find themselves out of luck if conditions change. They're not pandas. Raccoons get things done. Which brings us to us. Who are we as content strategists? Well, first off, for the rest of this hour or so, whatever we call each, whatever we call ourselves outside of this meetup, we are all content strategists. We're 
content strategists in that we're built to sometimes challenge and sometimes champion uh, the, the conventions of the web. We're built to um, embrace the value of content, the business value, and the strategic value of content of words and video and complex, like rich text fields and advanced machine learnable personalization models. We are here to really support the value uh, and the worth of, of content strategy. And we can all agree that these things are important. We're all on the same page with that. But here's where we get in trouble. There's a tendency in any specialized industry, much like a group of pandas, to hyper-focus on the industry itself. We focus on content strategy and the associated fields connected to it, content design, user research, content modeling, et cetera, et cetera. And in doing so, we kind of get in our own heads. You know, We forget that the world of web projects, they don't actually revolve around the practice of content strategy. I know. We're not alone. Web projects are, are big and complex and every discipline really runs this, this risk. Developers look at a project uh, from the eyes of, of their specific discipline. They see complex problems that they wanna solve and project managers look at a project through the eyes of their discipline. They see complex projects to keep under budget. We all have our own skills and we all have our own responsibilities and our own ownership uh, over certain areas of a project. Uh, we can tend to live in a bubble because of this and we can tend to lose sight uh, of the big picture. Uh, on, on one hand, that's okay. You know, we're humans, we have a unique uh, traits, we have unique areas of focus and that's by design. It makes the most sense for us in our day-to-day, -day, in our projects and on our teams, uh, within our processes to, to focus on the things that we're best at. But the irony is you know, not lost in this. Uh, a major underlying theme in the discourse around content and content strategy is the determination to uncover bias and to bring together different perspectives to really break down silos. Yet in practice, that's really difficult. You know, so while we want to be these perfect little multidisciplinary partners, we also have jobs to do, and those jobs are are really focused on the specifics of of uh, content strategy. And as we're hyper focused. On our work, as you know, as we as we're working toward the things that we are paid to do, ultimately it leads to a natural bias toward our discipline and toward our work. And so, as we break down silos between all the people that we're hoping to help with the website, we still risk building them within us and other web disciplines. Uh, but that's a, the biggest threat we provide to a project. The biggest threat is that we see content strategy and sometimes ourselves as a kind of Copernicus, in which all aspects of a web project revolves around the content. We see ourselves as arbiters of overall site strategy, as gatekeepers of like approved functionality. And it's, it's not hard to think this, you know, most sites are built around content and delivery of that content. Most sites are built with communication at its core, with information as like a core business asset. But the sun doesn't revolve around our discipline. We own as much of a project as everyone else and it's just, by nature of our focus, the content of the site, we find ourselves really running parallel along the entire scope of a web project. We are not the center of it. We're almost just kind of like uh, in a sidecar throughout the entire thing, assisting in key decisions from, from start to finish. Well, it looks like we're taking the lead. We're actually really running support. You know, decisions don't go through us, um, but they all happen uh, alongside us. We're not arbiters and we're not gatekeepers. We are connectors. We're helping bring ideas from the original discovery process to live in development. We're moving a content idea forward so it can be accurately represented like in design. We're building a content model that assists with the editorial process further down the line. We're touching really every point of a project, but very little of it really belongs to us, which means it's incredibly important to understand the entire scope of what can go into a web project. And so, Hey, what is a web project? I'm very glad you asked. I can give you the same slide that I've used for what feels like every single content type I've ever given in my life. It depends. We're better off breaking it down into what might be included in a web project rather than defining what a web project is. You know, like life, every project is a, is a unique and precious little bundle of complicated backstory and, and good intentions and, and misguided decisions. So let's pretend an organization is looking for a full-scale web project. There are really two common points in any web project. There is, uh, first what we call in the book, the initial spark. This is the beginning of a project. It doesn't start when we're talking about development or design or content, or even when we're researching users. 
but way back in the point when we've just decided for some reason that we need to build or fix or migrate a new site. There's a spark that has really put an entire web project into motion. And the other point we know about is when the project is done and it becomes something we need to maintain kind of ongoing. And between there, it's pretty open. It's different every single time. Remember, it depends. And it's this generalization of stuff in the middle, the stuff that changes from project to project that led my co-author, uh, Dean Barker, and, and myself to write the web project guide in which we broke this bunch of stuff happens part into 24 unique phases or, or stages. And walking through these are, is a talk for another time, but for the sake of this, we can group these into six pretty solid groups. Uh, first, we have the idea of planning, which is the work that's done to kind of set up the rest of the project. Um, this is where we're asking philosophical questions about the nature. We're beginning to assemble like our super team of web steering professionals, um, the group that's gonna really help this run really smoothly. We're asking about the point of building a new website in the first place and who needs to be on, in on these decisions. We're kind of like setting up a model for measurement. We're sometimes even talking about money. We're talking about attention. And of course, even at this phase, we don't have all the answers. So we're rolling into uh, the discovery phase or the research phase, the, the data portion of a project. You're all content strategists for this talk. So you all know where this stuff fits in, knowing your site users, figuring out what they want, uh, confirming what you already have, and then understanding how that content is, is being used on the current site. This is content audits and analytics and interviews and audiences, it's all here. It all informs the next section, which is focused on designing the experience. Uh, at Blend, we call this strategic design. This is your content strategy, your writing, your information architecture, and your graphic design. Uh, essentially, it's the creation of what's going to be on the site itself. This is the forward-facing actualization of the planning and discovery you've already gone through. From there, you'll need to determine how to translate content and design into something tangible, which means determining the actual system and site requirements. So this is understanding the content and design needs and how to move forward on a content management system or content framework uh, or determining you know, what integrations you're, you're putting in place to make the site work. Uh, then you move into active development. This is the curly brackets and the tabs of actual web development, programming front end, planning for hosting, the technical process of migrating content, if that's necessary, the stuff that, yuck, I don't, I, we have other people who do that and we're all happy that they're doing it. And then it's time to launch, but obviously the project doesn't end there. This is QA, site readiness, um, the who and the how of the future of the site. So governance and adjustment and, and ongoing maintenance. Essentially, how do we set the site up or the project up for success as it goes live and as the site grows alongside our organizations into the future? And the thing is, is that these 24 stages aren't present in every project. They're not always in this order. They're oftentimes uh, like a, a constant process of shifting from phase to phase. And especially within larger organizations that can afford uh, maybe a full-time team of content workers and designers and developers, you're jumping around all over the place. And like we said before, it kind of just depends what, what your stages might be for your project. And to our point, it also depends when it comes to the disciplines that are connected to each of these. I, it, it was one thing to see a list like this and assume that the project planning belongs to the project management group or that QA belongs to development. But in reality, each organization is as unique and precious as the projects that they're creating. So web projects aren't made of positions or, or job titles. They're made of actual people who take on specific roles. And those roles are usually whatever needs to happen to get the work done. And in fact, it's the strict adherence to job titles instead of roles. That, that causes the most pain when it comes to being connectors. You know, uh, content strategist Scott Kuby, who you know about because he's gonna be uh, talking with you in a few months. Uh, he wrote a really good post called design jobs and design roles aren't not the same thing. And he says the job titles and descriptions are often outdated and overly restrictive. They make people territorial and they often prevent people from using the full set of skills available because it's not their job. And I mentioned this only because one of our roles as content strategists, and I contend one of the roles of every discipline of the web project process is to understand the roles and high level concepts within each of the other disciplines. Because every organization is different, every organization also faces different challenges that kind of necessitate this, this kind of um, multidisciplinary content. 
So for more traditional large-scale web projects connected to well-funded organizations, departments tend to be better defined and better separated, uh, requiring kind of a more deliberate understanding of how things pass from one phase to the next or between sprints or however the project is set up. Um, on the other hand, a smaller team has to take the roles traditionally separated into their own unique disciplines and combine them. Blend is one of these small teams in which we have a really rich development practice and then a more generalist content and UX practice. It's necessary for me not just to understand a few disciplines in order to better you know, serve the needs of the customers, but also to understand how it will affect the development team that I work closely with every day. These different um, dis disciplines, these different uh, roles, understanding them doesn't come easy. And that's kind of by design. They're specialized, they're unique, they rely on jargon. Uh, jargon is okay sometimes, but we have to remember that jargon and the definitions connected to them are usually really hard to understand. Which brings me to a little, little aside. Uh, I gave this talk actually last month to, um, to a group out of Australia. And so I had to explain what the term inside baseball meant uh, because they just completely unaware of what that meant. So I had to stop and then go through that. But this kind of feels a little inside baseball, this whole idea of warning about the words and the terms that we use within our specific disciplines. This should sound familiar because you work in an industry that's in some way connected to the web. You know, specific web disciplines are perfect examples uh, of inside baseball, you know, because they're designed to help explain and define the scope of a system of work. They mean nothing to anyone outside of the web industry. And they mean almost everything to those, uh, to those of us within it. Uh, and I mean, of course they do. These things are, these are things we do the most. That we spend the largest amount of our time thinking about content and the strategic use of content and how to manage and maintain content. But then think about how we talk about these things. You know, when we're on our Slack channels, when we're in the hallway with our coworkers, when we're frustrated after somebody misinterpreted our intentions, our biggest beef is always around the perception of our work and why it's important. It's about definitions because we're trying to communicate what we need to make things better. And definitions are hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're attempting to draw hard lines between different disciplines, but our, our users, you know, our clients, our stakeholders, they don't care about those hard lines. They always assume that we're on the same page. They always assume the language of the web is a singular language. They just want to know what's coming next. Literally, that question is why we wrote the web project guide. Our clients kept wanting to know how the current task related to the overall project, how it factored into the final product. They didn't want complicated discussions around like specific philosophies. They want a context. And in doing so, we realized just how important it is to understand uh, that context, to, to set solid expectations from, from phase to phase, to be accountable and to always uh, make connections. And I mean, that's really what we're doing. That's really why we're doing all this if, if we think about it, these tasks, these spreadsheets, the word documents, the tables and graphs, the focus on word, the focus on, on clarity, we're communicators and content strategy is about effective communication. And we all know that communication is at its core always about translation. And I mean this in the traditional sense of the word, translation of a message into language, into visuals that people can understand. Uh, literal translation of different languages, translation of strategic goals into web features, uh, translation of context and syntax into machine readable data. But I also mean this in a, in a more ph philosophical way. When web teams build websites uh, or make adjustments or search for meaning in whatever way uh, we're used to searching for meaning, we do so in the name of user communication. That puts us as content strategists in the entire strategic design process in a really unique situation. Uh, I think that we as content strategists can get very frustrated uh, with everyone else because we are stewards of content and the concepts of content strategy and strategic design, which is understanding how user needs are communicated through words and, and layout and interactions uh, and the fulfillment of a technical promise are served by every element of the web process. But it's you know, not just about content. Being a connector doesn't mean pulling every other discipline inward. Yes, without content, there's certainly very little left on a website, 
But without the other disciplines, there's really nowhere for the content to be, which puts us again in a really unique situation. And I want to talk about how these connections happen across different disciplines, not just how they should work in a perfect world, um, but how our understanding uh, of the process can help make uh, better connections in the name of collaboration. For example, let's talk about requirement gathering. Uh, we typically think of requirement gathering as part of the initial planning phase, uh, but there's also an element re of requirement gathering that, that happens once we've uh, essentially determined our strategic plan. So in other words, the dream of the ongoing stages of a project should be connected through the work of discovery and design to the eventual, eventual system requirements that come from a, from a fully designed site. And relying solely on information gathering at the start uh, and making technology decisions before content has even been figured out separates the idea from the reality. It leads to a real uh, Gerber singles kind of situation. And this is where I get to talk about Gerber singles. Gerber, the US baby food company found themselves in a downturn after the public acceptance of contraception in the 1960s. Fewer babies meant fewer baby food sales. And as they sought to diversify, they thought, hey, what if baby food wasn't just for babies? And this brought us Gerber singles. Quick and easy meals for the newly independent, you know, college students, single adults, and they were all packaged in Gerber's existing jars. But I promise you, these are not baby food because they came in adult flavors like Mediterranean vegetables and creamed beef. It didn't work. They didn't do any user research. They assumed adult baby food was a good idea. And then it failed miserably since, you know, most people prefer their beef burgundy to have like texture and not be served in a baby food jar. Anyway, requirements. That's what happens if they're tackled too early and set in stone. On the other hand, if they're tackled too late in the process, if they're held off until after the strategic plan has been decided, you really run the risk of the project grinding to a stop. Choosing tools and developing solutions takes a lot of time. And there's a, there's a need to, for a through line that, that allows for adaptation of the plan to fit the tool as you're finding really a tool to fit the plan. In a perfect world, our role as connectors is to pair the content needs of the user and the company with potential functionality. If we know that users are arriving on the site to find information on specific mutual funds, we can make smart functional decisions to include a mutual fund search. Life's not perfect though. Our frustration comes from times when we're not brought in to help. And it's worth knowing that many times that's out of the web team's hands. Sometimes decisions have to be made quickly. Sometimes you don't get a month long buy-in from every department. And in this case, we connect by understanding budget, understanding business goals and understanding technical needs by having, you know, being a partner along in all of these different phases. Another example is with design. So content and design go hand in hand. Design's role is to provide, you know, organizational and graphic translation of our content. It's to say, take the idea of a podcast feed and to organize and illustrate that feed uh, in a way that's both aesthetically pleasing and in line with an expected content hierarchy. In a perfect world, our role as connectors is to provide guidance on how site design can remain flexible enough to allow for the content needs of both the users and the editors. Uh, we provide copy decks or we uh, even like a solid content model and, and design be, builds a container and, and iterates upon the environment in which that content uh, can thrive. Life is not perfect though. Uh, our frustrations come from times when content must bow to design for whatever reason, whether it's uh, a graphic standard or a call from up on high to provide something with a little bit more pop. Uh, we're not building art for the most part, but strong content minds can also forget the balance between functionality and, and aesthetic. And so in this case, to be connectors, it helps to understand the concepts and the practice of web design in order to work within constraints, in order to meet designers halfway. How does this work for a development project? Uh, or working within a content management system. Building a website is essentially building like a thousand choose your own adventure books at one time with the exception that there is actually no ending. It's just a combination of different templates and contexts and, and occasional design flourishes and developers are really trying to plan for now and the future. They're hoping to give a solution that succeeds 
whether you go to page 67 or whether you peek ahead to page 103. And in a perfect world, our role as connectors is to help developers understand how a chunk of content is used, how it flows across the site to connect with effortlessness, effortlessness and, and, and connect in perfect personalization um, and to bring back perfect search results, but why it's not perfect. And our frustration comes from the limitations and the balance of content management with editor, editor uh, usability. We get excited about what a template or a page or a system might be, and we sometimes forget how that template or page might work. Uh, content modeling and development is really a series of trade-offs in which we balance the right way with the time and attention it takes to maintain the right way. The smaller the team, the harder it's gonna be to build a content model that handles complexity in a way that's, that's manageable. And so in these cases, we can serve as connectors by helping to understand the limitations of machines, to understand that we're literally translating human syntax into robots via a million little fields. We have to tell them everything. And sometimes that does not balance well with our, with our content dreams. And then finally, let's talk about governance and maintenance. Our role is to be a research, resource beyond launch, to serve as a constant source of expertise, to fan the flame of user experience and content strategy and move forward like in this dream of constant improvement. And in a perfect world, our role as connectors is to do exactly this, to keep working on that A-B testing, to pull the development team in and hash out some complicated problems, to jump into design meetings and to provide our well-intended advice to keep things really moving and always updated and always audited. But one last time, life's not perfect and especially not perfect in the days after launch. As content strategists, we hope for the best. We hope for automation and, and, and constant audits and content processes, but people get busy. We've never encountered a project that ended in perfect bliss with like you know, zero issues after launch. And instead, initiatives get moved and audits get pushed off and automation takes an extra six months to plan. And so we get frustrated as, as content strategists. And in this case, we can be connectors by understanding not the limitations of machines, but understanding the limitations of people to understand that a new site is also a new job, that connections in this case are less to do with recommendations and more to do with prioritization. In each of these, there's the perfect world, the world in which we are, are freely to, where we're free to connect and to do our jobs as, as perfect as possible. And some of us may be in situations where like, this is just how it is and that's awesome. And you're very lucky, but most of us are not. Most of us feel it deep in our souls every time I, every time I said, life's not perfect. You know, you heard all of those perfect world scenarios and it's a lot. And that's the hard thing about being a, collect, a connector is that we actually can't do everything. But we're not supposed to, which brings us to the idea of availability. What's hard about this idea of being a connector, of being kind of a fully rounded person of knowledge to understand the concept of every web discipline is that we're all hampered by availability. And availability can mean a lot of things. It can be uh, availability of time. It can be like, you know, you sell the job and you have to do that job. Uh, you were hired to do that job and people depend on you to do that job. You know, we don't have all the, we don't all have the luxury to, to be able to spend 20% of our work week researching and connecting with, with all these different uh, practices. But honestly, more than that, we don't have the same access to experts. We don't have brilliance available, like just down the hall. Instead, we work on small teams or we work independently or we work in larger teams that are cut off from the, from the rest of the organization. But I wanna be really clear about this though. While it seems like the key to become a, a better connector is to figure a way around these availability issues to find uh, you know, more hours in the day or to, to bring more people on to, to lighten the load, really that's not it at all. Like more time and more people won't help. There's just too much out there. The key is understanding and accepting that we will never overcome these availability issues. Our roles aren't to be everything to everyone. And instead our role is to understand and be empathetic. And this isn't an issue of being multidisciplinary. This is an issue of finding the correct representation 
of multidisciplinary knowledge to find the balance. You know, um, in the research world, Eric Hall calls this a satisfying click. This is a quote I try to fit into literally every presentation I've ever done. You just work at it until it feels like you know enough. And for us as connectors, it's knowing at what point you're veering into details when you don't need to be veering into details. Because honestly, the, the challenge for web and agency and internal teams is not how close we get to competency. It's not uh, whether we've led our own agile project or whether we've built our own front end. It's about fostering an environment uh, that embraces questions. And it's about understanding terminology in a way that honors uh, the expertise uh, of those we work with, uh, which sounds a bit pious, like to honor the experience of the person handling your CMS install. But just as we you know, get really frustrated when our work is misunderstood, just as we flock to Slack channels to lament you know, in those moments when somebody doesn't understand what we do, so too do the project managers and the developers and the stakeholders. We owe it to our teammates, to our clients, to the people who lead us. We owe it to them to understand the basics of their process. And this is how we get our foot in the door to begin enacting meaningful change. This is how we make things happen, you know, to understand, not to do, not to take over, but to understand. Uh, I gave a talk back at uh, Confab in 2013. Uh, this is as big of a picture I can get, so you can see Christine is very pixely. Uh, it's called Empathy, Content Strategies Hidden Deliverable. It was the first breakout of the conference and it accidentally spawned a hashtag that still pops up from time to time. Uh, and that talk was often misinterpreted as a call for user empathy. Uh, but in reality, something's happened outside. There's, there's sirens going by. Nothing, nothing happened. Um, yeah, so this, this talk was, was misinterpreted as a call for, for empathy for the user. But in reality, what it was is a call for empathy with each other, uh, with our clients, with our teammates. It was all about understanding uh, that we don't all come into the game with the same amount of knowledge. And those of us who, who get to call ourselves experts, even if we're experts in some small thing, we also need to show a level of empathy, of kindness and understanding to share our knowledge. There are really no laws that force us to listen to each other or to understand each other. We've seen this obviously on a global scale. We know this from some of our past holiday dinners with awkward uncles, but we, we also know that in our business and in our field, when we're turning like ethereal concepts into digital representations where our work is judged by people with no background in the process and robots with no context you know, in, in human syntax where everything we do can really be deleted like with the sudden crash of a server, we owe it to each other to, to really make the effort. And that's what I mean when I talk about multidisciplinary. My definition isn't like a complete understanding of everything, it's more simple. It's about pushing toward a multidisciplinary approach uh, to conduct. Um, it's understanding all phases uh, of the project. And even though this meetup is virtual, you know, we can look around the virtual room and find ourselves in a position that makes this possible here uh, in, in a shared space with, with other content strategists and writers and designers and really smart, curious people, we're really focusing on those connections between the thing we're creating and the people we're creating them for. You know, we're focused on bridging gaps, on bringing people together. Within our teams, bringing people together looks a lot different than so, simply like cultivating and understanding through, through web content. It means inviting everyone into the same room to create spaces where knowledge overlaps. And so this is how we maintain connections. Uh, over the projects that I've taken part in, both with clients and within our own team at Blend, this overlap in knowledge requires three things. Uh, it requires regularity, it requires accountability, and it requires distribution. And I want to go through each of these and provide an example of how we've integrated this within our own projects. Uh, first, regularly. In order to be the connectors that our projects need, we need to make time. We need to build routines. Did you know that finding a scholarly inspiring quote that talks about routine in a positive way is nearly impossible? People don't say good things about routine because there's this idea that it constructs us. But in reality, you know, in the workplace, in teams where schedules overlap and contradict, regularity and routine is the only way that connectivity happens. We need to make sure we're meeting regularly. Check-ins, steering committees, sharing circles, like listening to each other, uh, understanding not just how our work fits in, but how our group's work fits in with another group's work. Well, this isn't a magic fill. This isn't 
or your magic pill, <laughs> magic pill. This isn't surefire uh, by any means. You know, we can schedule uh, we can schedule time, but that doesn't mean it's always going to be fruitful time. You know, there's going to be a lot of frustrating weeks, as many frustrating weeks as there are enlightening weeks. Uh, but, but what matters is that it happens, that it's given time to happen and it constantly happens, even when the people who are in charge of making it happen don't really want it to happen. That week. And so, for example, at Blend, um, I come from actually the world of QA. When I was hired at Blend 11 years ago, we weren't sure if we had enough work to really maintain a full content strategy and information architecture practice. So I was also brought in to do QA on our websites. Um, QA is ultimately nothing more than like the most multidisciplinary act that you can do on a website. Uh, it's kind of touching and reaching into all the pieces that everybody put together. And now you're trying to vet them and make sure that they work. And so what we've developed is a QA alignment meeting so that QA isn't on an island by themselves so that QA gets to work with what project management, what development and what content strategy needs. We can discuss the overall impact of that specific discipline while that discipline also understands the overall impact of what it does to us. Um, and really what we do is we simply talk about what's come up in the last few weeks. Uh, it's not a dev meeting, it's not a PM meeting, it's just a company meeting, it's just an alignment meeting. Which brings us to accountability. You know, connectivity needs responsibility and responsibility needs to be ultimately shared. The goal um, of bringing different departments together isn't just to share ideas, but to provide each area a chance to be accountable for forward movement, to make decisions, to log to-dos, to learn from each other, to collaborate. So at Blend, we often urge clients to develop a, a web steering committee, which I think is a pretty common thing these days. Um, in the beginning, the web steering committee is usually who we work with on, on the week-to-week -week deliverables and communication. Uh, it's designed to sort of represent not just the, the thoughts and the desires of the marketing department, but to represent the larger scope of the organization. But it's not really about steering web strategy. It's about providing a mingling point for different areas of expertise within the company and really keeping everyone accountable for their own area of expertise. So instead of uh, a single leader just handing out edicts, the group has agency and leverage to make things happen, all because they understand how everyone else might work. Which reminds me really about the role of leadership in this kind of connectivity. Uh, accountability between departments is important, uh, but if you're a leader, you also have a responsibility to develop policy that helps promote accountability. It's not just those who are in day-to-day -day work who you know, threaten the idea of collaboration and connectivity, it's leaders. And I say this from a place of leadership. We help decide where focus goes and where time goes. Not everyone will take this on themselves, even if they want to, they wanna hear it from leadership. So give your times or give your teams time to interact and to intermingle, uh, to give them opportunities to learn and to shadow, uh, to buy books, you know, if you can think of a specific one to help communicate context. And most importantly, hold yourself accountable for building a team that knows each other, that actually can connect. And that brings us to this last point, this idea of distribution. Uh, in order to be the connectors that our projects need, us as content strategists need connections to work both ways. If it won't work if we try to do it ourselves. And this can be really hard for us. Content strategists really, we, I think we all, I know personally, uh, fall into that category of like, fine, I'll just do it myself. Like, fine. Fine, it looks like content's going to have to save the day again. And I think our first thought is to get defensive about this, to like hold tight. We want to protect our area. We were misunderstood for so long. And now that we have, you know, a seat at the table, we want to make sure we hold that seat really tight. Um, until leadership is going to force the other departments to work on this, we're just gonna to have to continue to be stubborn. But the thing is, is that leadership can really only do too much. Like if we think of the actual concept of a series of silos, it's not the openings at top that help connect all the brain. Leadership can give us tools, but in the, like those of us in the mix, we need to bust through the walls that are sort of in the middle of those silos. And it's this, I mean, here's a representation of a bunch of different types of projects and different phases of a project in which different people work on different things at different times. What leadership can do, uh, and, and those of us who are, um, you know, intrepid enough to, to, to start setting these meetings up, we can actually 
determine where those breakthrough points are. We can build them into our existing processes. We can make sure that we're all meeting at the same time to pass knowledge along throughout a project. And this way, content and development and project management, they begin interacting. And more importantly, they begin sharing processes as a part of uh, company policy. Like soon, this is no longer a top-down or content-first initiative. This is just how things work. Uh, and for us at Blend, this level of discipline overlap is baked into how we communicate on weekly status calls instead of onboarding developers later on or um, shedding strategy as it you know as we get closer to launch. Uh, Blend, when possible, attempts to provide representation from technical user experience, project management, and stakeholders along every step of the way. And what this allows for is two things. Uh, number one, exposure in our process, uh, and also better handoffs when we move from discipline to discipline. And so regularity, accountability, and distribution, these are the things that, that our teams need to stay connected for us to be uh, effective connectors. Um, there's one final thing that keeps us honest and, and moving forward, and that is the, um, the idea of staying educated. So if you take one thing from this talk, it's at you that we uh, are best equipped to promote connectivity between disciplines in our projects, in our teams, in our day-to-day. -day. More so it's in our best interests. You know this, you're attending a meetup on a beautiful day uh, after work. Um, you attend webinars, you read blog posts. My urge is to look a little beyond what you've already consumed or what you're already consuming. Look for things just over and outside uh, of your comfort zone. And this can manifest in a lot of different ways. And it, if there's one thing that kind of, like, kind of came out of the pandemic as, as a positive, it's that availability and accessibility of professional education has become so much more commonplace, which gives us this amazing, uh, like the possibility to stretch beyond our disciplines. Uh, education within our expertise is still really, really important. It helps us learn new techniques and it helps us keep up with trends, but education outside of our expertise is what helps us grow. So keep going to conferences, but go to conferences outside your area of expertise, you know? Catch webinars about content management systems or read blog posts from the project management world. Um, even here within the industry, if you're writing forward, spend some time diving into like Ditta. Look into new disciplines or, or shadow along with a designer or a project manager. Like find a bunch of blogs and fill up your RSS reader. Oh, man, quick shout out to RSS readers. Uh, now that we're all like shifting back toward email newsletters, I really hope to see a resurgence of good RSS readers as like this new cool tech legacy trend. I don't know. Uh, I know before, every time I say this, people put comments in like, here's the reader you should use. I use, I don't know, use, I don't know what reader I use. I still have one. I just really miss Google Reader. It was like perfect. As a personal note, this is like the story of my entire career. Like when I was brought in at Blend as a content strategist, we had not yet developed a robust content UX practice. Like I said, I was Blend's first ever dedicated QA manager. And for some, this sounds like a nightmare, but I tell this to people all the time and I legitimately mean it. I learned more about content, work, how content works and the content modeling and how to, uh, how to develop and how to work with people doing QA that I have in any conference talk about content strategy. Beyond language and message and how it's navigated, how it's connected, uh, how to understand edge cases, how to plan for failure, how to predict uh, the future uh, and support the user, I, did, I learned more about that just doing QA work. And in this, I was really lucky. Like I was able to enter the industry as a generalist and I get to continue as a generalist. Uh, I was brought on as a Swiss army knife uh, and in doing that, I was able to be a connector. I was able to, to dive deep when it was necessary because I've been fortunate enough to really touch all aspects of the web project at some point in time. But it's really like not luck. It's just availability. I was forced into that QA role, but I continue to cross pollinate my knowledge with different items here and there. Like it doesn't have to be all encompassing. I know how it goes. Like boundaries have purpose and our projects are filled with delineations, with separations, with distinct roles, with uh, rigid management. Um, and these delineations are important. They help promote efficiency and they help maximize expertise and they give teams direction um, to, to, both, to know where they're most valuable uh, from, from day to day. Devs do this, uh, PMs do this. 
contact people through this. But that doesn't mean that we can't step into those areas to observe, uh, to learn, and to make connections. We're valuable in our own roles because we're good at those roles. But why can't we like keep upgrading? You know, why can't we keep learning to keep finding new ideas outside of our disciplines to kind of remove the concept of it's not my job, and instead jump in uh, head first, to, at least enough uh, to be informed. All right, I promise this. Um, I guess that brings me to this big secret, my big secret. Um, I, I always am afraid I'm going to get uninvited from every meetup in the future because this is the point in which I reveal a little bit about how I'm a total fraud. I helped write a book over the past two years, and then it was published and it's been pro promoting it for a year. Uh, I wrote 14 to the 24 chapters. Uh, I helped deeply edit the full 24 chapters and pretty much have my fingers and my thoughts and my name. And my expertise over those 24 chapters, I wrote or helped write about stakeholder meetings and content deliverables and tracking data insights, uh, setting up servers, um, hundreds of things. I am not an expert in any of them. I essentially wrote 400 pages on things I don't know a lot about. I don't know a lot about web hosting. I know expert in web governance or information architecture or project management. I don't know uh, as much about content models as Jeff Eaton. I don't know um, as much about adaptive content as Karen McGrain. I don't know as much about content strategy as Christina Halverson. But the big secret of the web is that you don't need to. Like we live in a world with many resources. I can diagnose what's wrong with my washing machine using an online help desk. I can try to fix my washing machine with a YouTube video. And I, and I pretty quickly understand when it's time to give up and ask an expert. So too, here in this industry, we attend conferences not to memorize every line from every talk, but to expose ourselves to new concepts, to add a few tools to our tool belt, uh, ultimately like to save a YouTube video for later to understand uh, when to call in uh, those experts. And the biggest secret of the web is that you don't need to. Like we live in a world filled with these resources. I don't believe any of us need to have perfected content strategy or have been multi-time viewers of Confab, uh, what we're tasked with is adapting and connecting uh, those concepts to our own situations to understand how the goals of our projects and the people we create things for are, are helped by. Uh, and I struggled to say this uh, in its cheesiness, but it's true. The rich tapestry of web project strategy. We look around and think that we're destined at the end of the day to be pandas, lonely pandas that were working really as hard as they can to carve out a little niche, allowed only to snack on bamboo, which is insane because bamboo seems really hard and tasteless. Well, I wouldn't know because I'm not a panda. I don't, there it is. There it is. I'm not a panda, I'm a raccoon. I'm a raccoon and we are all raccoons. We're all adaptable. We all know that it's better to steal pizza from somebody's picnic table than it is to slowly die out due to evolutionary stubbornness. It's our job and it's everyone's job ultimately, but especially our job to understand this entire process, to understand the entire industry, the things on the edges and the things in the middle. This isn't about running into another department and stealing away somebody's role. This is not about taking on every role in the process of a site or even knowing how to do every role in the process. It's just about understanding the why behind those tasks, really to, to help bridge our different worlds and to help provide connectivity because we are all ultimately the connectors um, and we're not, we don't have to be uh, the only ones. That is it. Thank you so much for listening. Um, this book is 100% for free. I talk, I joke about like buying it. You can actually get it for free. It's um, at webproject.guide, which has been already linked, um, but it's for sale if you want your own physical copy. I'm very proud of it. I think you'd enjoy it. Um, more importantly, we've actually started a podcast, uh, which really dives into this whole concept, this idea of reaching out and doing multidisciplinary discussions with uh, Dean, who's a tech guy, and me, who's a content guy, and whoever else it is. We just actually had a, a release an episode with Erica Hall talking about research, which is the thing that neither Dean or I do incredibly well. So uh, check that out at webproject.guide slash podcast. Um, I also write about like music and stuff like that. But um, yeah, uh, that's... That's what I have, hooray. Thanks, Corey. <clears throat> We've got yeah. some questions queued up in the, in the chat. Um, let me go ahead and jump right into them. You bet. 
Um, so Kim asked, let me scroll back to this. I want to read it correctly. <clears throat> um, Kim asks, uh, what do you think about the job title content designer versus content strategist? Um, I have an opportunity to craft new job titles and job descriptions for my team. And Kim, if you want to uh, unmute and elaborate on that, feel free. Oh, I'm not hearing you, Kim. <laughs> I wonder if there's a tech thing. Corey, maybe go ahead and we'll see if we can get Kim. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing. Um, here's the problem. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. Um, I don't know ultimately like what the difference is title-wise because I have always worked a as a generalist. Like these are just things that you do to make content work is ultimately kind of, I kind of have seen it. I know, I understand that in a larger organization, you start to separate out those job titles because you want to differentiate the specific sets of roles. Um, but, uh, you know, so you, you might have, instead of having a team of like five content strategists, you might have a team that includes a content designer because that content designer does a more specific set of roles just to sort of be able to fill skill-wise uh, better into what that is. Um, we run into that in almost every department here. Like, the difference between having a bunch of developers and having like a dedicated .NET developer or having a dedicated developer that focuses on one content management system. Um, that I can see it working that way, but I feel like, um, I, I really feel like the title of content design is really, really specific. And I think that uh, mo in most situations, people probably don't need that title. I, I say that with so many caveats because I know that's really important. I know. Jonathan Coleman's floating around out there and he's so mad I just said that because he's <laughs> he's been championing the I, that title for so long but like I don't I don't see the I don't we would never have a content designer here at blend because it's just not part of what our workflow is so I think it ultimately just depends on the specific roles and whether or not it sort of justifies the idea of a, of a content designer uh, title yeah hey, thanks and Ariel had a question um, and again Ariel if you want to unmute and elaborate feel free but I'll go ahead and read the question uh, one of the things I struggle with is how to handle the times when I overlap with a product designer and see some challenges in the way the design has been fleshed out obviously the ideal is that I would have been involved in the work from the beginning but the reality is that I often come in at the end to add content um, any tips on how to handle that interaction when I sort of need to step in and say uh, we need to fix this Yeah, that gets at the heart of it. <laughs> I'm just curious, curious about kind of, you know, we've been talking a little bit about how the roles, how we have those moments of overlap and how um, it's just kind of about not stepping on toes while also trying to work toward the best possible scenario yeah. um, in the experience. Um, I think that um, this is a really big ask because it is an organizational, uh, it's an organizational ask. Um, what we have learned over the past uh, maybe three or four years is that uh, we, we've tried to get rid of as many meetings as possible because meetings, a lot of meetings are just like, we don't need these meetings, but we've actually found that we've needed to add more meetings and they're all along that line of an alignment meeting where you just like literally get together, you handpick a team that's designated to be like, this is the alignment team for strategic design. And it can be your content strategists, your writers, your designers you don't have to talk about the specific project. And instead what you do is you just discuss the process. And as you discuss the process, you then introduce the idea that you should probably be there earlier. Um, that's, I mean, that's what we've done in this. That's how we kind of, and what ends up happening is those meetings never stop. You like, we started this like, oh, we should have this QA alignment meeting. And what it's spread into is now we have alignment meetings on either side. And then we have to kind of have those groups meet to align as well. But eventually what happens is you have this sort of like overall process that really identifies when is a person helpful in a situation and when is a person completely wasting their time in a situation. Um, so again, big ask because you've got to go like make an organizational change to do something like that. But it's, it's not a bad suggestion to like, just reach out and say like, hey, independent of project because then you're not picking at somebody's work. Just like bring up the idea of, of kind of getting together. Yeah. Thanks. I'm yeah. trying to do some of that. I'm doing a little dog and pony show of like, how do you work with me? Perfect. <laughs> so that's I'm exactly that, that. taking that around to teams. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I just met with our, we have a, a pretty new crew of project managers we just hired on 
I had to go like, go remind everybody, hey, like this is how it works. So when you get into the project management phase and you're trying to figure out what Corey's doing in the office that day, this is what I'm doing. This is the type of work I'm doing. It's not easily digestible into a ticket, like, uh, like, a, like a dev type thing, like a, like a feature or a bug. It's right. like a little bit more soft on the edges. And so dog and pony shows are great. <laughs> They're fun too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Corey. Yeah. Corey, and Jim asks, um, he said, speaking on the we can't do everything uh, and availability, do you have any tips on how to find a healthy balance between letting something fail versus struggling to keep the plates spinning and saving the day? Um, yeah, especially letting something fail if you know that it's going to reflect poorly on you and your work. Um, that's hard. I think that... Uh, we see a lot of help in the area. It doesn't really help at the time that it's failing, but the idea of like full project retrospectives with the full team to like go back and over and say like, these are the reasons content maybe didn't work. Um, a lot of really difficult conversations come out of that because at that point you are sort of suddenly pointing fingers in different directions. Um, but it, to me, that's always been the most uh, the most beneficial thing. It's It's really hard because you should still try to make the things work. And like, there's a, there's that balance of, well, my job is to make sure this turned out well, but also it's not my job to babysit the other group. And so you, you, it's like almost a personal and organizational balance of like, where do I land on, on that spectrum? I don't know if I, I don't know if that, that question answered anything, but. Or that oh, no, that, that totally got it. Okay, good. <laughs> so yeah, I, one of the challenges that I often have is that um, usually when you're, you're doing content authoring, you're at the end of the chain. So like, you know, if design's like, well, you know, we have to rethink this and we're going to take mm -hmm. another week. And then it all kind of chips away at the time that I've got at the end. Yeah. And so it's like, well, you know, it, it would be wonderful if there were 45 hours in a day, but yeah. apparently there's only 24 and you can only get a really good solid, maybe 12 to 14 that you can work in. Uh -huh. So like, you know, something <laughs> has to give somewhere. And yeah, you know, it's just trying not to be, I guess the, the problem that I have is trying not to be the person that just goes above and beyond every time. Like it's mm -hmm. above and beyond is good when it's recognized when it's above and beyond, not when yeah. it's every single time. Yeah. Oh, I feel this as a, as a person who used to be in QA, when that's <laughs> the point where like, oh, right, you got three days left to QA the site and hopefully you can get all the fixes in. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, it's a hard position, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, there, there really is a lot to be said about, about having a retrospective that says like, hey, I only had three days to do this. And so we did our best, you know. I, I want to jump in just for a second, because I think, you know, I was thinking, Corey, when you were talking about accountability and, mm -hmm. and empathy, and then kind of to, to Jim's point here about when things fail. One of the things that I've been thinking about and trying to practice, honestly, a lot more, you know, kind of as my, as I get further into this kind of you know, work is transparency. Um, and that mm -hmm. is, you know, just being honest when yeah. something is looks like it might fail or you're overworked or, uh, you know, you've made a mistake or you don't know the answer to something, right? I mean, I think especially mm -hmm. sometimes when you're uh, a consultant, uh, you know, you, but it's probably true in-house too, you know, like mm -hmm. you say, you're sort of expected to be the expert on, on all of these things and sometimes you're not. And I think- yep. You know, sometimes having a little bit of that up front, just saying, you know what, I don't know, or I did that wrong, is there time to redo it or whatever, you know, may mm -hmm. kind of avert some of those kind of failures down the road. You know, I think if, you know, as, as you know, if, if leadership is able to kind of, uh, you know, encourage that in their in, you know, in teams and be able to kind of say, it's all right to admit that you failed here or that, yep. you know, something is wrong here. You know, I think both, you know, in terms of kind of morale and, and, and better outcomes, I think it's, you know, it's a, a good practice. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it's Marietta here. I know you haven't seen me on a lot of these, but um, I just want to say this has just been such a great, uh, a great presentation and, and conversation. And I feel like you've been walking around in my brain for the past couple of weeks, like everything you're saying. <laughs> I could, and even like Ariel, um, when you were saying like, I have to put on my dog and pony show to explain like what content strategy does. I was literally um, working on a deck like that earlier this week. You were like, 
the week. And then your thing about connectors, <laughs> being contact connectors. And that was like, oh my God, that, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But the, um, the theme that I was kind of working on was um, content strategy as the bridge discipline. Sure. The bridges between all these different, different disciplines. And I was just, and it's so funny that you have a bridge in your background too, right? Okay. Look behind you. There it is. <laughs> the bridge of many all falls. Yeah. No, anyways, I just wanted to thank you because everything you're saying is like articulating all the ideas that have just been floating around in my mind as a way to introduce content strategy to other disciplines and say like, this is how you bring us into a project. This is why you want us in early. Right. This is where we can provide you some insight. Like we don't need to own your stuff. We don't need to own your part of the deck or this or this or that. But it's that connectivity, like you said, from end to end. Mm -hmm. um, we're like a thread that can go through the whole thing. So yeah. um, I just wanted to thank you because I just feel like, you know, it's just like it's so great to hear that reflected awesome. back from other professionals. So Marietta, you're welcome. So I re really, really appreciate it. Awesome. Corey, I'd like to follow up on that with um, <clears throat> something that just keeps coming up in my world is everything is like moving left that everybody wants content earlier, accessibility earlier, mm -hmm. localization, everything earlier in the process. So you end up with this uh, possible jumble at the start of every project where everybody's involved doing stuff from the get go. Uh, did you account for that in your project guide? Uh, no. And here's why um, the guide is not meant to be uh, a read front to back type of thing. It is like, I need to know a little bit about content inventories. I need to know a little bit about hosting. I just need a little know about a topic within this. But the understanding in this, and I, in the introduction, we talk about this. All of these projects go everywhere at the same time. Like you're bringing in consultants super early to talk about CMS. You might not select for three months on the line. You need to have somebody who's thinking about accessibility at the design phase, but also thinking about it during the governance phase. Um, it's just a lot of overlap in all those different phases. And it was really hard to kind of like piece together what that order might be. Um, so no, it's, it's, it's hard. That's like the hardest part about it is, is that um, there is sort of a what's next idea to it, but in reality, it's kind of like, well, what do you need right now? And we'll help you kind of figure out what the inputs and outputs of that process might be. And you have to kind of plan from there. Thanks. Yeah, I love that. That's perfect. Hey, Jesse had a question. Um, where do you see the diff the biggest differences between content strategy work in-house versus through an agency or versus freelance? Those three scenarios, I guess, in-house, agency, freelance. Yeah. Um, I have actually never done uh, freelance uh, content strategy. I've only done it as a part of uh, a larger agency. I have a lot of friends who do it, uh, who do it independently. What ends up happening is, well, here's what I see. Con strategy as a as a um, as a like independent person, more often than not, you're brought in to sort of help lead a process, and you will be eventually dropped at some point because there's a certain point in which you're just attending meetings, and you're there to provide feedback, but your deliverables become more important because at some point they want to stop paying you. Um, as agency, I'm still around, but I still kind of disappear once the site's launched and they've taken it over. And in-house always seems to be way more focused on the end part, um, essentially maintenance and ongoing. Your, your on-site content strategists are really more focused on sort of maintaining a site. They're more focused on writing. Um, they're more focused on maybe helping develop new projects within a larger site or within a larger um, sort of initiative. But unfortunately, a lot of times also, organizations don't trust their in-house team to handle a lot of the big time strategy at the start of like a brand new website, um, which is kind of a bummer sometimes. Um, but also there's a value in having an outside voice come in. Um, I've worked a few times with, an or with organizations that have existing content strategists and I always get really, they're like, you could put me in a room with all these really fancy executives. The person I'm gonna be most nervous about is the content strategist who's gonna be sitting there silently judging everything I do because I'm wandering in as like, Oh, look at me. It's the big hero who's coming to lead this project the right way. And in reality, I'm like, I, I know enough to put a process around what you're doing, but this person knows so much more about the domain itself and about the site and all that stuff. Um, and so I always want to kind of like touch base and be like, okay, everything's cool. Uh, you know, your boss wanted me here. You're going to do this work. You're definitely more important. I am in this project than, than uh, that makes it. That's kind of how I see the separation is, is, is along 
those lines. Now, of course, obviously there's edge cases with everything. Um, you know, I do, I know an independent consultant who's been working with the same project forever. Uh, you know, there's like four or five years and they do a little bit of everything for them. And that's, that's awesome if you can get that, but for the most part, you get dropped when the, when the site launches. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions in the, um, in the queue. Paula, did you have anything else or? Uh, no, other than I was just really resonating with, with, with what Corey is saying about, you know, the sort of, I think sometimes for better or worse, when you are, you know, the, the freelancer or the, the consultant, you, you, you get to kind of walk away and, and leave it to the, yeah. to the, you know, the client to, to manage it going forward. I mean, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure everything that blend does is, is incredible, but I bet somewhere in there, there's some website that you built that you look back at and go, when we handed it off, it looked and worked very differently than it does now. Don't judge us by what it looks like uh -huh. now, right? Yeah. So that's, I think, you know. That's why we don't link to live sites on the website. We only, yeah. we only show pictures of the finished work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never yeah. link to the actual site because who knows what it looks like, especially like three years on the line. Yeah. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and of course the in-house thing, you know, you, you do have that sort of ownership, um, but you know, you also, again, that for better or worse, you know, that can, yeah. it can get boring, you know, or you can kind of get into that point where you really are just, you know, feeling like you're, you're just keeping the trains running versus innovating or thinking new things or, um, you know, building new stuff. So anyway, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, unless there are any other questions, um, I think we can thank yeah, Corey. Gonna, oh, sorry. I just want to point out that there's a really interesting uh, chat. It's not really questions in, in the chat, though, about mm -hmm. the job title thing, content mm -hmm. strategy, and the appropriation of the role. I mean, it's a whole other conversation, but I'll, I'll, I'll definitely save the chat and we'll, we'll share that somewhere on the website or in the Slack channel or someplace because it's a, I uh, just want to call attention to that conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw this rolling through here and I didn't see it. there weren't questions, so I wasn't going to jump in on it. But it's so hard too because I think really like uh, the people like there's there's groups who who really focus on titles and they have to focus on titles because of the organization they're in and they have to differentiate themselves. I have always been so like a, whatever about titles, and the reason is because I'm lucky enough to be like the person who does the thing here. Like I don't we don't have to, I don't have to be like I do this and you do that. Um, for better and for worse, you know, obviously. Uh, and it's, and there's so much validity. Here's the story. I never thought about this this way until, uh, until a, a friend of mine who was just a, who was called, called a writer. Uh, he was a writer at a local ad agency. Um, he moved up kind of in terms of responsibility and moved up in pay and moved on and on and on, obviously not enough pay and I'll get to that. Uh, but as over time, he never had a new title. He was just writer. And so when it got to the point where he was really frustrated with the work that he is doing at this ad agency and he wanted to move on someplace else, he didn't have any sort of clout in the title. He had been working at this place forever, led all these big decisions, and he'd had no title to actually like represent that. And so people didn't take him seriously when, when he went in to, to like actually apply for jobs and stuff, which is a thing I'd never thought of because I, you know, I'd, I'll, I'll be a blind until this place, you know, was gone a hundred years from now, who knows? Uh, it's, 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 so at that point, I kind of realized, oh, right, titles mean a lot of people, a lot to a lot of people, and a lot of it's just sort of in that. Um, not that you're tied to your title and you use it for self worth, but it is, uh, it is essentially a signifier of like the work that you've done to make it to a certain point. And so I, I, I get it now. And I feel bad about all those times I said titles don't matter. <laughs> well, I was going to chime in on that. Um... Yeah, sometimes when I'm explaining content strategy to people who don't understand it at all, I said it's like a full arc. You know, on one end, you have content strategy that's in a marketing context. And the, the idea is, and this is where your marketing people are kind of coming into that, where it's like, I've got this nugget of content. How can I distribute it across multiple channels? What is my strategy for distributing this content and getting it to different audiences? Then sort of in the middle of that, you have, um, and then on the, you know, and then in the middle of that, you have like web content strategy, which is really looking at how does information move, you know, through the website, you know, not just from a marketing channel perspective. And then I, then on the farther end of the arc is where you have it 
where it's a much more technical discipline where you're really getting into data and you're really getting into, um, you know, product information systems and dam systems and naming and taxonomy and, and tagging. And so when I, when I go to explain content strategy to groups that don't really know much about it, I said, it really can be that full arc. And mm-hmm. so or sometimes if we're starting a client engagement um, and the client isn't that familiar, I'll kind of explain content strategy and then say like, okay, so we're kind of playing in this part of the arc. We're playing where we're like, how does how do we develop content that's appropriate for an audience and get it distributed to all these different places? Or are we playing in like, how do we tag it and get it served up? You know, like, are we, or am I sitting next to the developer? Like basically am I sitting next to the marketing team or am I sitting next to the developer for this project? Right. Right. Yeah. So just wanted to no, get it out there for yeah, yeah. yeah. And I would say, you know, as content strategists, most of us fall somewhere in terms of our interests and skills somewhere along that arc, right? Some of us really love tools and systems and, and, you know, structuring and, and, you know, doing the, that more sort of technical end of it. And some people are really on the end of, voice and tone and messaging and, and, you know, kind of the more, as you're saying, kind of more the, the marketing or sort of creative end of that. So all of it's, it's all a big, everyone is needed and welcome. Absolutely. All right. Well, on that note, uh, Let's uh, let's call it a night. Um, again, thanks to Corey. Uh, he is, uh, has joined us from South Dakota, so it's there I am. Beautiful Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It's yeah. it's dark. Uh, yeah. It is nine <laughs> nine twenty one p.m. It is dark in South Dakota, and it's beautiful. I'm gonna go walk to the car now. I guess. <laughs> no. Well, we appreciate you staying staying at your desk and staying up late to talk to us. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone for being here, and uh, we hope to see you at one of our other events. Thank you so Bye, much. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks. I'm totally Bye. buying the book right now, Corey. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Bye. Hey, Paul and Corey, I'll leave the Zoom open for just a minute if you want to do anything. Sure. I'll, I'll stick oh. around. Yeah. Somebody's got a dog. <clears throat> All right. Sorry, I really was not looking myself up in the book. I just, you know, I was like, <laughs> any. <laughs> I was oh, like, oh, oh, I hear what they have to say about audits. Like, oh my gosh, I mentioned it. Was like, I was if any, thrilled and if, surprised. <laughs> if any book comes out and I have a marginal relationship with the author or I know them from like, if I've heard of them, I always look myself up in it. Because I never know. It's the same thing. It's like, it's like, oh, I, there's, uh, it's weird because sometimes, you know, like when you Google your name, things will pop up. Um, I was looking for something. I was like, try, actually, here's what I was doing. I was showing my daughter how to Google her name. And I was like, here, how's you do? Here's how you do it. And the weird things will pop up once every like legitimately once every five or six years i'll get a notification when i google my name that says like hey you forgot to you you're here's that we have a check of yours that you need to now claim from like the state government oh, right, right. Uh, like some 12 dollar <laughs> yeah, check yeah. that i moved and it was stuck there and uh and so i'll you know do that but there was something where like some talk i gave back in 2013 i think it was that empathy talk in 2013 it was like mentioned in some college students uh like thesis slideshow and I was like oh that's me right there I was I was I was the person he googled and found the answer and then dropped it in there quick to get his wow. you know get his thesis done but I was like <laughs> how weird how weird these little things end up spreading yeah. everywhere yeah yeah I'm just always well, pa- surprised I don't ever expect you know so it's like oh my gosh Paula you wrote a book about a very specific topic you should be in all of the times that that topic is is mentioned so yeah yeah okay yeah. all right um Go ahead and, and get yourself home. And Sounds good. Know. I wish I could have come to Seattle for this. I love Seattle. I haven't been there since uh, 2001. Oh, wow. I was in Seattle. Wow. Well, you're overdue. I don't know. Come visit. Yeah, Button is going to happen there in the fall, in October. Just saying. I don't. I volunteered for Button the first year it happened. It's not the right overlap with what I talk about or mm-hmm. do because I, it's so product focused and we're always, we're so open-ended web CMS focused. So. Yeah. Um, it's like, I gotta, I go to Confab. I've been, to, I, yeah, I've been to Confab every year and I got to keep that streak going. So I can't justify going to button too. Although now I kind of want to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to credit you both this year. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right, well, thank you. This is a lot of All fun. Right. Yeah. The, Thanks, Corey. Great. Thanks All so right, much, yeah. Corey. See ya. Yeah. We'll talk soon. All right. Yeah, Bye-bye. Nice See y'all.